I'm Mark Koch for Kit Planes Magazine. I don't get to do this very often, but this is a lot of fun. This is an airplane that very, very few people have flown, and I'm gonna to get to go fly it. I'm here with Brad Dom from uh, Cub Crafters. And of course, this is the Carbon Cub UL. If you uh, were at Sun and Fun, you saw this debut. It's a terrific airplane, looks like a Carbon Cub. Everything we expect, except it's got a little bit of a surprise forward of the firewall. It's got the Rotax 916. Thanks for taking some time with me, Brad. Tell me a little bit about this project and how it came to be. Yeah, so Cub Crafters, um, we really needed an airplane for international markets. And the two key things for the international markets are you have to have an airplane that can run on idle gas. Our high compression ratio, traditional aviation engines, uh, they just don't well, do well on auto gas. Um, Ab gas is available in the U.S. It's available in some places in the world, other places in the world it just simply isn't. So for us, uh, that was key to an airplane for international distribution. Uh, the other piece of it is that we really wanted an airplane that fit into the UL or the ultralight category in a lot of jurisdictions around the world that don't have an LSA category or don't have a real developed general aviation community. Uh, so those are places like Argentina where you've got a ultralight category at 600 kilograms and an advanced ultralight category at 700 kilograms. Or Germany, where you've got an ultralight category at 600 kilograms, you've got to be, have a BRS chute in the airplane within that 600 kilograms. Um, Israel, they've got an LSA category there. This airplane will fit into the LSA category. So that's what we were looking for with this airplane, is an airplane that had carbon cub performance, runs on multi-fuel technology, it's a multi-fuel engine, um, and uh, we can put it in a lot of jurisdictions where customers have been asking, when's Carbon Cub gonna show up here? When are we gonna have a Carbon Cub you know, in our area that we can get excited about? And we shouldn't have an airplane to, to, to sell them. So to be clear, this airplane is also will be LSA in the, in the US as it's currently configured. Yeah, so we will build the airplane as an LSA here in the US. We don't have a similar ultralight category here in the US, ours is a part 103 ultralight, which is a lot different airplane than what this is. So we'll build the airplane here in the USA, we'll flight test it as an LSA, and we will offer it to US customers as an LSA, along with other jurisdictions, Australia, Israel, uh, places like that that have an LSA category, we'll offer it there as an LSA. Other places that don't have an LSA category, but have an ultralight category or a UL category, that's a 600 kilo, or a 700 kilo ultralight airplane, um, it'll fit into that category as well. So you guys are the launch customer for the Rotax 916. Tell me a little bit about how that came to be. When we surveyed all the engine options out there that met those requirements, uh, Rotax was really the top of the top of the heap choice. Um, you know, they had had 912 out there for quite a while, had a great history with the 915. Um, the 916 was going to be their next product entry. Uh, they were hoping to have more inroads into the type of adventure flying that we do, that our customers appreciate. And we were looking, again, for a lightweight engine that runs on different types of fuels um, and a company that has a good, robust international service center network. We want people in South America to be able to get service for this engine in their own language, in their own country. Rotax was also able to provide that. Now this is something new for Cub Crafters. You guys have been traditional aircraft engines the whole time uh, since Jim R Richmond's early days. So what kind of, a, I won't say challenge, but what was, what was it like to develop an entirely new firewall forward package uh, for this airplane? Well, let me start with my experience with the airplane. I headed off to Sun and Fun. I had two or three hours in the airplane, just enough to barely get to know it. I had maybe only flown behind Rotax airplanes engines two or three hours before that. So I didn't walk in with a lot of preconceived notions on what a Rotax is, what a Rotax was supposed to be. I was really impressed. Having flown behind traditional aircraft engines for most of the, of the time I've been flying these types of airplanes, 30 years and over 6,000 hours, uh, the engine was quiet, it was powerful, it was smooth, it accelerated well. It had great fuel economy. It did everything I asked it to do and it, asked, it did it very well. With regards to integrating on our airframe, yeah, there are some challenges. Um, it's a water-cooled engine. We've never done that before. So we've got more and different radiators to think about and figure out. It's got a different fuel system, a different supply 
side on the fuel system. So we have to do a few things differently than we've done in the past. Uh, there's more accessories that have to fit underneath the cowl. Intercoolers and oil sumps and all kinds of stuff. So all that had to be thought about as well. Uh, what we're looking at right behind us here is our first try at that. And we're not all the way there. We still have some stuff to figure out. Uh, but we're, we're pretty far advanced on the integration of the Rotax engine uh, with the Cub Crafters Carbon Cub airframe. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, for uh, the story that will appear in kit planes, you'll see photos of the engine installation. And uh, this really is sort of a first article in the sense that you guys are doing, still doing a lot of testing. It's considered a prototype airplane. Uh, much could change between now and when you finalize the, the airplane. Uh, but in that context, what are we looking at in timeline? I know that the development process is, is iterative and it takes a little bit of effort, a lot of effort. Uh, where do you guys find yourself in the timeline? Well, let's, let's, let's pull back a little bit on the timeline. So uh, we started talking to Rotax about this project back in 2019. Um, information was exchanged, ideas, uh, relationships were built, that sort of stuff. And then two years ago at Oshkosh, we sat down with Rotax and uh, we actually came up with a firm plan that we shook hands on uh, that Cub Crafters was going to be their launch customer for the 916 and they were going to be our launch customer for the Carbon Cub UL, uh, this lightweight new airplane. And each party held up their end of the deal. We got the engine in time, we were able to integrate the engine, we got the data we needed uh, to be able to do that. And we had the first flying 916 anywhere. As far as I know, we may still have the only flying 916 anywhere. And we're quickly learning about how that engine behaves and what we need to do to finish the integration uh, with our airframe. So uh, the plan from there, so this was Oshkosh two years ago. We were going to launch at Sun Fun 2023. Uh, we did that launch. That launch went very well. This airplane behind me is an engineering prototype. So it is, other than you and I flying it here uh, today and tomorrow, uh, it's dedicated fully to the engineering um, team. And they are doing flight testing with different props, uh, different uh, radiator configurations, a whole bunch of different stuff to learn how to best design the final version of the airplane that will be put in consumers' hands. So that's what this airplane does for the remainder of 2023, is it does true engineering work to refine the design. Early in 2024, we'll have half a dozen of these airplanes built and out in the field and doing market survey. That won't be the final design either. One of the things that Cup Crafters really likes to do that we really feel makes our products better is we like to do market survey work where we get customers in the airplane, we listen carefully to what they like, what they don't like, those sorts of things. And then we can iterate the design from there based on how they experience it because this is all about the experience at the end of the day it's not about the hardware so we want them to have a good customer experience a good experience flying the airplane so we take that we feed that back into the system we lock the design mid 2024 uh, the third quarter of 2024 uh, manufacturing gets the design and they get to start figuring out how to build the airplane and do it on a production line at scale in our facility and they'll fully build one airplane down the production line uh, with all of the different manufacturing technicians and managers that are responsible for building the airplane for the consumer, they'll have access to the airplane, to the plans, they'll learn what works well, what doesn't work well, and that may further result in some design changes. Hey, engineering, you put this bolt where we really can't access it in a production setting to be able to build the airplane successfully. So there will be some of that. The first consumer versions of the airplane come out in 2025, and uh, we've sold, I think, the first eight production positions already on it. And that's uh, without a final design lock, um, that's without a final weight on the airplane, and that's without a final price on the airplane. So people are excited, they're enthusiastic, uh, people are lining up to buy this thing, and it's going to be a great performing airplane. Now you mentioned weight, and that's an important consideration for some of these international categories that you talked about. You know, we know the, the 912 series engines, including the 916, are, are very lightweight for, for their horsepower, uh, even after you add a turbocharger and intercooler and all that sort of thing. Um, but I know that you guys have done a lot of other things in the airframe to also reduce weight. Kind of walk me through what you've done. Sure. So the installed weight of the 916 engine compared to the 
traditional CC340 engine we'd have in a first generation Garvin Gub. Um, depending on which prop you have, uh, you, which prop you've chosen, is anywhere from 40 to 70 pounds lighter. So we're getting a big chunk of it right there just with the engine installation itself. Uh, but then, going back on the airplane, the prop we're flying right now is one of the lightest props we've ever flown. It's a E-props, it's a fully composite prop, and this prop weighs under nine pounds. Uh, the prop itself, the spinner, uh, the hub, um, the bolts, everything that attached to the engine, I think it's 8.3 pounds for that whole assembly. This carbon cub has the first, uh, instead of a wet layup composite, which is a heavier way of making composites, it's got a pre-preg composite cowling. Uh, so the composite shows up here, it has got the resin uh, pre-impregnated in the composite fabric, and it's activated by heat. Those composites themselves are about 30% lighter than wet layup composites at the end of the day. Uh, this airplane has a titanium firewall, and you'll see more titanium sheet metal components in this airplane. It has titanium landing gear on it. Uh, we have several vendors that have become very good at welding titanium components. Uh, so some of those accessories, like landing gear, engine mount, that sort of stuff, can or will go to titanium uh, to help us make weight on the airplane. Um, there's some stuff we can do with the seats on the airplane uh, to make them lighter. This has got a lightweight avionics package in it. It's got the small screen G3X instead of the 10.6 inch screen G3X. So those are the types of things we're looking at. At the end of the day, our goal is to have an airplane that at a 600 kilos or 1320 maximum gross weight has enough useful load for a 200 pound pilot, 120 pound passenger, 20 gallons of gas, and 20 pounds of baggage. That's and we really think impressive. we'll get there. That's really impressive. Uh, so tell me a bit, little bit about uh, the performance. You've had a, a bit of time to fly the airplane, uh, understanding that we're still in the development phase and that lots of numbers could move around. But give us some idea of what, what you're seeing in terms of performance. Well, I don't want to spoil <laughs> the, uh, the surprise of you flying the airplane. Okay. I will say that it, it accelerates really good. It's pretty fast. Uh, it climbs pretty well. Um, and I think you'll be impressed. This guy's a master of understatement, so I'm probably going to make all sorts of weird noises on the tape. We'll get to that in the next video, but, uh, but suffice it to say that a turbocharged airplane certainly has some benefits uh, in terms of density altitude uh, for ground running. Uh, takeoff roll and initial climb should be pretty good, uh, even at high density altitudes. And of course, if you take it to altitude, uh, the cruise performance should just continue to improve as the higher you go. And we know from experience with the 915 that this engine family is very fuel efficient. So uh, it, it'll be really interesting to see how this really does in, in the real world. Uh, but I think it'll be uh, impressive to uh, a lot of guys who are used to, you know, big engines. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one hint. Okay. So um, uh, Rotax says the airplane will make takeoff power up to 17,000 feet and cruise power up to 23,000 feet with the turbocharger. Mm -hmm. um, at 17.5, I was still seeing 45.6 inches of manifold pressure, so I think they're actually underselling that. Interesting. Now, and and for the record, that's 160 horsepower at takeoff and 141, one something like that for continuous, I believe. Correct. So when you think about it, an O360 at about 7,000 feet is is starting to lose power while this thing's holding power, even at the max continuous. Now we're not talking about takeoff power. Yeah. So so in terms of takeoff power. Uh, compared to a 180 horsepower normally aspirated engine, um, you start to make more takeoff horsepower at a density altitude of around 3,500, 4,000 feet. And that's and not all that high. Cruise power, um, again, about six, 7,000 feet. Uh, this airplane's making more than a normally aspirated air engine would. And of course, the fuel economy means you don't have to carry as much fuel. So you have 24 usable or 24 total in this. And that helps keep the weight down, just makes the airplane, I would imagine, at the lighter weight, this is a really fun airplane to fly. Yep. It is a very fun airplane to fly as it is, and 100 pounds less, and it'll be a lot more fun to fly. Really, for us, if you look at the history of the Carbon Cub, uh, it was first introduced as the Sport Cub with a 100 horsepower engine back in 2006. 2009, we put the 180 horsepower stroked 0320 engine in there, the CC340 engine. Every iteration beyond there, we've added more technology, we've added more performance, we've gone faster, better avionics, more fuel, bigger baggage areas, higher VNE, you know, all that sort of stuff. But all those things have added weight to the airplane. 
on the airplanes gotten heavier and heavier and heavier. So the typical third generation carbon cub that's going out the door now is 1,100 to 1,150 pounds. This airplane is all about taking it the other direction. Uh, going back to that original carbon cub concept, which you know, typically in the early years, carbon cubs were out the, going out the door at 900 to 950 pounds and getting it down to 850 pounds uh, with a few options on the airplane even. And that's an impressive number because this is a full-size airplane. I think when we talk about some of the LSA airplanes and we think, okay, it's a very light airplane, you don't realize that we're talking about a very small airplane and not a lot of interior volume, not a lot of wing. And in this, this is a full-size airplane. This yeah. is a fully grown-up airplane. And to get it that weight down uh, is a real impressive feat. Well, we're not there yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. Yeah, keep working on it. So, thanks for, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to fly the airplane. I'm looking forward to doing it. Going to do that next. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know how it flies, what kind of performance we see uh, in, uh, in another video and certainly on the pages of Kit Planes. But thanks again for taking the time to do this. And uh, now we're going to go have some fun. We'll see you guys later.